All right, all right. Here we are live. I'm Michael Millerman. Somebody sent me this article, The Brahmins of Democracy, Bolshevism versus Menshevism, published January 12th. This is the show infrared.substack.com. Show infrared dot substack dot com the brahmins of democracy i haven't seen this yet i'm just going to do one of these things where we read an article together go through it comment on it so it's kind of a long article that means it's going to be a live ish live stream and uh that's what we're doing we're going over this article infrared show infrared dot substack dot com i guess let me just drop the link for you in the chat can i do that uh Okay, hopefully you got something there. This is the article that we're going over. And, sorry, I forgot to get this set up in advance. There we go, let's put that up on screen. Yeah, guys, we're just gonna be going over this article. Uh, it's got something to do with Dugan, something to do with the left, and I'm curious to know what it is, and I thought we'd just do it together. Okay, so here we go. Um, let's see, molded in the criminal brains of the leader of the Paris Commune and sanctified in the brains of an Oriental fanatic, Nikolai Lenin, 1930s Terran raising the alarm bell on the famous red-brown Duganist Knotsbull Huey Long. The rumors were embarrassing enough for the Communist Party. Now they openly platform the paranoid delusions of Taryn Fivek, the infamous wrecker of the Workers' World Party, who has now moved on to wreak havoc within the Communist Party. I should say, by the way, for anybody who's going to be watching this or who's watching it now, I don't know these inner world disputes on the left, but this article has something to do with Dugan, so we're just going to read it and you guys can hash it out in the comments and in the chat if you'd like. Taryn is known for possessing the paranoic fantasy that the ideas of Rasput, I mean Alexander Dugan, have managed to somehow infiltrate segments of the Western left. Oh, I, okay, I guess Taryn Fivek is probably the author of that uh, Communist Party USA article that we covered on this channel a while back, warning people of uh, the appeal of Alexander Dugan's thought and cautioning against being seduced by it. Taryn is known for possessing the paranoic fantasy that the ideas of Alexander Dugan have managed to somehow infiltrate segments of the Western left. The rise of the so-called Red-Brown Alliance, which Taryn associates with the likes of Jimmy Dore, Slava Zizek, Glenn Greenwald, and Caleb Maupin, all stem from the nefarious and magical influence of the renowned Russian thinker. Alexander Dugan. Taryn is known to be the main enemy within the Communist Party of any trace of socialist patriotism. In her view, this basic Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy must be flung overboard due to the uniquely evil nature of the United States as a country founded by slave-owning, white, cisgendered, and able-bodied males. Echoing the sentiment of the 1619 Project, endorsed by the National Committee, Taryn believes that the founding of the United States was essentially reactionary and that, in fact, the British Empire was, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, progressive. How very democratic. Only for all her fixations on the threat of patriotic socialists infiltrating the party, it is Taryn that shamelessly and uncritically repeats a time and tested tradition unique to this country, that of Philistine snake oil salesmen, fear-mongering about mystical and malign threats from the Orient. Taryn repeats the uniquely American historical tradition of attributing to social and cultural phenomena the ideas of intellectuals they haven't read, either because they're too dim-witted, lazy, dogmatically a Philistine, or all three. From the Red Scare of the 1920s and 50s to the fear-mongering about cultural Marxism, postmodernism, and now critical race theory, Taryn effectively carries on the torch of American grifters, drawing from the vast intellectual content of fringe, often, economic, uh, often academic trends, so as to induce feelings of hysteria and paranoia in their target audiences. Naturally, this fear-mongering always contains with it a grain of truth. There's an infinite wealth of intellectual content to be presented out of context, and the paranoid mind takes care of the rest. 
those of you who are here, we're reading this show infrared.substack.com article, The Brahmins of Democracy. Could it be Dugan directly speaks about grand Eurasian ambitions? Surely he is responsible for the Russian geopolitical strategy we now witness. The idea must be responsible for the reality because they mirror one another. What the dim-witted American Philistine cannot seem to come to terms with, however, is that thinkers like Dugan take the very same reality as their own object that Taran tries to. Dugan is just as much an innocent bystander speculating about the same reality Taran attributes him causal responsibility for. Paranoic Philistines cannot possibly grasp this openness of ideas and ideation before material reality, since in their idealism, which is inevitably always paranoid, material reality is itself conditioned by ideal forms. Dugan's ideas, Taran alleges, are responsible for the new generation of left-wing figureheads who prioritize the struggle against liberalism and democracy instead of the fascist threat. And by liberalism and democracy, we know Taran could not possibly be referring to any abstract ideals. Surely, she doesn't mean that since such ideals have already long been abandoned by the ruling class. That is not only in terms of their actions, which was true even for the period of classical liberalism stemming from the 19th century up to the Great Depression, but even formally. Let us recall Stalin's last speech delivered to the communist parties of the world. Quote, Earlier, the bourgeoisie presented themselves as liberal. They were for bourgeois democratic freedom and in that way gained popularity with the people. Now, there is not one remaining trace of liberalism. There is no such thing as freedom of personality anymore. Personal rights are now only acknowledged by them, the owners of capital. All the other citizens are regarded as raw materials that are only for exploitation. The principle of equal rights for people and nations is trodden in the dust and is replaced by the principle of full rights for the exploiting minority and the lack of rights of the exploited majority of the citizens. The banner of bourgeois democratic freedom has been flung overboard, end quote. After the creation of the deep state, which we can imagine the leaders of the Communist Party view as a fascist myth, the rule of the military industrial complex, the rise of three letter agencies capable of acting with total impunity, the transformation of bourgeois democracy into the shameless and open dictatorship of the Wall Street financial class and the complete abandonment of the democratic principle of the right to the self-determination of nations with the United States foreign interventions, which possess zero democratic sanction and which even violate the US constitution, can we not laugh and scoff at the notion that there remains any semblance of bourgeois democracy to defend? Just a quick reminder here, I'm reading an article called The Brahmins of Democracy, and the link is in the chat. The NGO think tank media academic complex, the self-anointed Brahmins of Democracy, entirely unelected network of social engineers, ideologists, public policy influence, influencers, and lobbyists, maintain only the veneer and appearance of democracy. It only excuses the various transgressions against American formal democracy, by the deep state and calls this the defense of democracy. To point out the violation of democracy, the violation of law and the constitution itself threatens the legit legitimacy of democracy. By pointing out how the ruling class has abandoned any semblance of democracy, one risks being targeted by the likes of Taran, the author of that article against Dugan, I guess in the Communist Party USA, cite and other Brahmins of democracy as a Duganist or fascist menace to democracy. Maybe those of you who are watching this now have something to say about it. Feel free to chime in in the chat, you know, reacting, to the, uh, reacting to the article. It's clear what they mean, the self-anointed Brahmins of democracy, by democracy, white lies and unspoken truths. Who better undermined the sanctity of democracy than Julian Assange, who pays the price for his crime against democracy to this day for exposing otherwise concealed war crimes and the way the Democratic National Convention democratically stole the nomination from Sanders. Russian agent, Duganist, fascist, how dare one challenge the smokescreen of democracy, never mind the real thing. Indeed, perhaps there remains a core foundation of bourgeois democracy within the United States, but it is precisely the so-called red-brown figureheads, in addition to libertarians like Ron Paul, who set this foundation against the veneer of democracy 
projected by the mass media academic NGO complex or the Brahmins of liberal democracy. It is precisely the so-called reactionaries and red-brown crypto-fascists which attempt to defend any semblance of principled formal democracy against the excesses of the deep state and the ruling class, which regularly transgress openly and shamelessly of the core foundations of the Republican of democracy. It is precisely the Jimmy Dores and Glenn Greenwalds which elect to defend the civil liberties of the people against the defenders of democracy, the self-anointed Brahmins of democracy. But what of Dugan and his critique of liberalism and democracy? What relation could Dugan possibly possess to the likes of, say, Jimmy Dore or Caleb Maupin? Okay, quick comment again, just so everyone's on the same page. We are reading showinfrared.substack.com, the Brahmins of democracy, responding to this Communist Party of USA article warning the left not to get too close to Dugan. And here we have this author accusing that author of uh, defending the Brahmins of democracy and taking the side of the so-called red-brown figureheads like Glenn Greenwald and these other figures, Jimmy Dore, Caleb Maupin, um, Assange, maybe you could say Darren Beatty, maybe you could say Steve Bannon, but some sort of uh, reactionary attack on the citadel of Brahmin style democracy. All right, let's go on here. So what of Dugan and his critique of liberalism and democracy? What relation could Dugan possibly possess to the likes of, say, Jimmy Dore or Caleb Maupin? Dugan and his relevance. Let us peer into the origins of the so-called Red-Brown Alliance and the fundamental reason liberal fanatics have raised the specter of Duganism against the resurgent populism we now witness in the United States. The Russian people first became acquainted with democracy and liberalism in its current form in the aftermath of the Russian constitutional crisis of 1993, when Boris Yeltsin democratically dissolved the Supreme Soviet and Russian parliament without any constitutional sanction by use of military tanks, heavy projectile ammunition, and assault rifles. What followed was the near open dictatorship of the Russian oligarchs and the West toxificated former Soviet managerial class ecstatic and drunkenly fanatical about the promises of enlightened Western liberalism. In this glorious triumph of democracy and liberalism, an entire civilization was nearly destroyed, the will of the Russian people broken, and mortality rates came to rival wartime conditions. Naturally, one comes to understand the context that gives rise to Dugan's fierce critique of modernity, liberalism, and democracy. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the question of which way forward for the Russian people inevitably came to the fore of every independent-minded Russian intellectual. Although Dugin recognized communism as an alternative and heretical form of modernity, he viewed the collapse of the Soviet bloc as proving its ultimate unviolability. Traditional Soviet Marxism-Leninism was not equipped to make sense of the new era. After all, it was incapable of preventing the overthrow of the Soviet Union itself. It was not enough for Dugin to challenge the catastrophe that was Western liberalism and so-called democracy for Russia. He found it necessary to go to what he considered the very roots of this evil, namely Western modernity itself. Within Russia, a multitude of different political tendencies came to find a sense of unity in their struggle against the liberal dictatorship of the 1990s, despite their ideological differences. Self-proclaimed monarchists, communists, and ultranationalists joined together in their struggle against the democratic looting and robbery of their country, the democratic suffocation of their people, and the democratic surrendering of Russia to American imperialism. The Cold War, which was the fundamental axis around which ideological differences had been defined, was over. Ideological differences began to dissolve into a heap of confusion, and a more fundamental opposition between authentically popular forces on the one hand and an establishment aligned with global American imperialism and its aforementioned ruling class institutions and networks was starting to become intelligible. By the way, just hello to everybody who's here and who's in the chat and who's watching now or later. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Amidst this confusion lay a lack of ideological and theoretic clarity. A more broad historical meta narrative and meta politics became necessary that pierced through the narrow and now relativized ideologies of the 20th century. 
Martin Heidegger. who Taron criminally mentions only in passing as a Nazi, as if that's even a fraction of what has propelled him into significance in the Western canon, would present a similar question as the overarching question of being, now known as the school of ontology. In short, the ideologies of the 20th century dealt only in the language of particular beings, but not being as such. They lacked the self-awareness to situate themselves within a reality more fundamental than described within the narrow confines of the ideology itself. Enter Alexander Dugin, the most renowned Russian disciple of Heidegger, who sets this question on a new basis within the context of Russia's unique historical and geopolitical situation. As a disciple of Heidegger, Dugin was able to recognize the material and objective reality of Russian civilization and geopolitics beyond ideology. The Soviet Union was a strictly ideological project that took Marxist-Leninist ideology as the sole foundation of its existence. Yet even after having officially abandoned Marxist-Leninist ideology with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the deeper reality of Russian civilization that inherited Soviet geopolitics continued to persist proving that Soviet realities were not entirely conditioned by one particular ideology. Here lies almost the entire basis of the mystique and terror Dugan's likeness evokes in Western liberals trapped within the confines of classical modernity. Dugan, following Heidegger, recognizes the fundamental and latent ambiguity of material being as something that gives rise to a multitude of ideologies while being conditioned by none of them. This material ambiguity is nothing short of chaos, which the whole of rationalistic modern philosophy, beginning with Descartes, set about to foreclose any acknowledgement of, an attempt first challenged by Marx. Those of you just checking in, this is showinfrared.substack.com. We're reading their article on the Brahmins of democracy. Let's keep going. There's... Uh, this is something Taryn in her neurotic idealism could not possibly understand about Dugan. The more Dugan gives expression to the ambiguity of material reality, the more she paranoically casts this imminent ambiguity as the disguise of fascist or Nazi ideology. Henry, thanks for the super chat. I appreciate that. I find Eric Zemmour to be a uh, compelling and exciting candidate. I don't live in France. I don't know the full situation, but I'm watching him and I like what I see so far. Paranoia, after all, is a cope in the face of ambiguity. Back to the text here. For a lonely person, it's easier to believe that everyone is conspiring against you than accept the traumatic realization that no one cares about you. In the same way, it's easier for the liberal to believe people like Dugan and myself, author writes, are secretly fascists rather than accept the loneliness of reality before it gets represented by an ideology. Got to say, I'm quite enjoying this so far. What Dugan does is refuse to privilege ideologies as the most fundamental means by which a thinker may inquire into the nature of being, reality, and the world. A certain pragmatism is even inherent in the whole field of geopolitics itself. Relationships between geography, statehood, and space in the abstract are indifferent to ideologies. They refer to realities that are inevitable, notwithstanding them. My kid's in the other room playing a video game. He's being kind of loud. I'm just going to ask him to quiet down. Give me a second here. Uh... The key to the recent fear-mongering over the rise of fascism lies only in a broader breakdown of Anglo-Saxon liberalism, more specifically the transition into a new historical era. American ideologists are coping with the decline of their empire. The recent fear-mongering over fascism, Russiagate, bizarre delusions like the Havana Syndrome, and even QAnon alongside Taryn's own witch-hunting over Duganists, all represent an attempt to find meaning amidst the destruction of American unipolar globalism. The liberal American mind cannot comprehend the end of the unipolar world order. They have to impose the idea that Russia and China are conspiring to take America's place, it cannot accept the breakdown of the establishment in resurgent populism. It has to impose the idea that fascist ideas are secretly behind the phenomena. This pattern reflects an inability to be reconciled with the loss of an idol, the idol being the eidos of rationalistic modernity, 
the substance of Spinoza, the object of modern metaphysics. Today's anti-fascism is mere copium in the face of materially political chaos. All right, let's just pause there for a minute. Once again, going through show info, red.substack.com's article, The Brahmins of Democracy. I like this if you're enjoying it. Share it if you think somebody else might enjoy it. You see over here, we have dugancourse.com. That's one of the courses on Dugan I have in my school. And let's go back to the article. Feel free, by the way, if you guys have strong reactions to anything you're hearing here to hash it out in the chat or in the comments. Materialism and Mao Zedong thought, MZT. Amidst Terran's deranged and venomous pile of screed, let's say the leaders of the Communist Party decided to embarrass themselves by publishing, uh, we find only a single attempt to ground the attack on Dugan in Marxist phraseology. You see, up until that point, Taryn had based her attacks in explicitly and shamelessly liberal language. Let us read the brilliance of Taryn's words, the preeminent Marxist philosopher of our time, and her critique of Dugan. Quote, Therefore, when it comes to what must be rejected from communism, Dugan says the first and primary rejection must be of historical materialism, along with materialist reductionism and economic determinism. Unquote. Taryn elects to one-up her ideological enemies, that is ourselves, by pointing out that Dugan has made negative comments in regards to materialism, an obviously integral and essential component of Marxism. Further, she attributes the shortcomings of Dugan's thinking to this explicit rejection of materialism. Ladies and gentlemen, we are walking in the midst of intellectual giants. Witness the brilliance of Taryn, quote, uh, well, okay, not quote, sorry, this is a contrived quote. Dugan say a bad thing about, a bad thing Marxists seem to talk about a lot since Taryn Marxist. Everything bad about Dugan is because he say a bad thing about thing Marxists talk about. Everyone brainwashed by Dugan. Na, 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 boo, boo. Dugan's signal against Marxist worldview are less authentic Marxist than me. Yet, the problem is twofold. One, by materialism, Dugan does not, whether he believes it so or not, mean the materialism of Marx. Secondly, from an actually informed Marxist perspective, Dugan can only be challenged as being too materialistic, that is, vulgarly and one-sidedly materialistic, and not dialectical. It is typical upon expounding the tenets of Soviet Marxism-Leninism into the language of philosophy for Soviet and Russian thinkers to interpret materialism strictly in the terms of French materialism or Spinozism. There's ample historical precedent for this too, the great Soviet philosopher uh, Ilyenkov, a faithful adherent of Orthodox Soviet Marxism-Leninism, could go no farther in his conception of materialism than that of Spinoza's substantialism. All modern philosophy is incapable of conceiving the brilliance of dialectical materialism. It wavers between the one-sided materialism of Spinoza or the idealism of Kant. Hi, everybody who's here. Nice to see you, quote unquote, as it were. The dialectical materialism specific to Marxism-Leninism has never been successfully expounded into the terms of modern philosophy. The tradition of Marxism itself, after all, began with a definitive break with modern philosophy. It has remained a science whose province has always been practical and political rather than contemplative and speculative. So-called reactionary and conservative, including religious critiques of materialism, have in mind that reduction of all being to substance, the reduction of every essence to sensuous and already measurable realities. Marx, in his critique of German idealism, never returned to this one-sided and vulgar materialism of a metaphysically disguised nature separated from man, and moreover, did not by the word material mean a substance. Material better translates to essential, and for the first time in the history of thought, Marx conceives of an essence that is itself essential rather than formal. That is to say, the real essence of form, the materiality of the ideal. Guys, here we're reading this show, infrared.substack.com, responding to the Terran article from the Communist Party of the uh, USA about Dugan, and in particular here getting into the philosophy of materiality. Every philosophical conception of essence, beginning with Plato, conceives of essences as forms, ideals, or discrete definitions of thought that possess privileged significance in the determination of reality. But for Marx, the essence is itself the essence of forms, ideals, and definitions of thought. 
reducing this essence to a specific form of material reality, like economics, entirely misses the point and only repeats the error of idealism. For Marx to inquire into the nature of the essence or of material reality is the province of practical science. No dogmatic or ready-made form of what material reality is, is to be presumed. The material essence is not a substance since it is not already latent with phenomenal or ideal form. Thus, Marx's materialism is referential rather than metaphysical. It points toward a way of relating to the world without prescribing the content of this relation. For instance, Marx writes that man is the highest essence for man, but what does he mean by man? Does he mean Feuerbach's ideal man for himself? Feuerbach? No, the question, for the question is itself a matter of practical inquiry. What man is, Marx writes, is the world of man, state, society. It is the ensemble of the social relations. Material reality is something one can only point toward, but knowing what it consists in is itself the province of science. To work for humanity, to participate in the world of humanity, is to take man as the highest essence for man. An essence is not a hidden appearance, but the appearance whereupon it passes through its opposite, returns and arises again from its own premises. We're over here. I'm not pointing as we go through this, but... Uh... And the entire purport of materialism is such that, excuse me, is that such premises cannot be dictated by the terms of the appearance or the form itself. According to the vulgar materialists, a one-sided material essence determines appearances without regard for them. All returns to the abode of substance. For the materialism of Marx, by contrast, the material essence is the reconciliation and sublation of all appearance and form. It's the real process of the reproduction, a process that's by no means readily evident in its output. Okay, those of you who are listening, who are here, who are following along, this is the author distinguishing a one-sided materialism, the kind that the author of the other Communist Party USA piece on Dugan ascribed to Dugan. So he's distinguishing this simple version of materialism that is not shared by Marx with Marx's notion of materialism. Let's just keep going. For the same reason, no ideology, including materialist ideologies like Soviet Marxism-Leninism, is capable of grounding its own truly material premises. This is precisely one of the dilemmas Soviet Marxism-Leninism in its mature stages was confronted with. On the one hand, Marxism-Leninism is materialist. On the other hand, materialism cannot be reconciled with the way in which Soviet Marxism-Leninism, nevertheless itself being an ideology, attempted to consolidate and fully ground its own premises up to the very structure of the party and Soviet statehood. Hold on, I gotta tell my kid to be quiet again. For Soviet philosophers like Ilyankov, who ranks among the mightiest thinkers of the 20th century, this dilemma was expounded in the form of the contradiction between the cosmological forces that give rise to the thinking spirit and the latter's attainment of universal self-consciousness. The parallel is clear. Ilyankov represents real geopolitical, social, and historical forces in the form of cosmological nature and represents Soviet Marxist-Leninist ideology in the form of the thinking spirit or Hegelian self-consciousness in general. For Ilyankov, the dilemma takes the form of the second law of thermodynamics. Guys, we're reading show infrared.substack.com, the Brahmins of Democracy. The thinking spirit is the highest culmination of the development of matter, yet the arrow of time points in a direction no longer conducive to this development. The thinking spirit arose from conditions of less entropy, and in the heat death of the universe, all cosmological development ceases entirely. Facing this, Ilyankov arises at the provocative conclusion, illustrating the relationship between Soviet ideology and its material premises. Thinking beings in the highest point of their development will assume as their cosmological duty the unleashing of a cosmic catastrophe, an act of all-encompassing apocalyptic self-immolation that will at once lead to the fiery rebirth of the cosmos, reversing the process of matter's thermal decay. In this collective act of self-sacrificial heroism, the thinking spirit may yet again give rise to the conditions that enabled its own development in the first place. Spirit then may condition the development of matter 
as matter had developed, excuse me, had conditioned the development of spirit. It is often believed that the late Soviet period is primarily defined by decay and the replacement of sincere ideological belief with cynicism. On the contrary, it was marked with the same eschatological apocalyptic anxiety that can be found in the works of Ilyankov. Struggling to reconcile its founding ideological mission with the geopolitical realities that would come to actually define it, the real vigor and ideological power of the Soviet Union was such that its mere existence evoked the atmosphere of a world that was always on the precipice of thermal nuclear annihilation. Gorbachev's acceleration was in actuality a desperate attempt to forestall and slow the winds of fate. The Soviet Union was destined to become something that its leaders were not equipped to adjust themselves to or make sense of. They had inherited a geopolitical monstrosity, which they were too weak, corrupt, and complacent to be worthy of. As with Ilyankov's thinking spirit, for Soviet Marxism-Leninism to be reconciled with its premises would amount to nothing short of the destruction and rebirth of the world anew, i.e. the destruction of the post-war global order and the end of American hegemony. It is precisely these material premises that Dugan's work seeks to give pure and undiluted expression to, freed from the dogmatic straitjacket of official Soviet Marxist-Leninist ideology, specifically in a traditionalist and even mystical form. Following Heidegger, poetry and muthos are the privileged mediums for the expression of an authentic material being, freed from the reductive presuppositions corresponding to the forgetting of being, unique to Western rationalistic modernity. For Dugin, like Soviet Marxism-Leninism itself, following Russian Orthodox eschatology, the dialectic between the ideal and material takes only singular form, and moreover the form of a final sublation located only in the end times, i.e. like the Soviet reaching of communism or global proletarian revolution. On the one hand lies the dark, boundless depth of eternity, and on the other the golden, peerless radiance of Logos. This dualism is a common theme of Dugan's works, from his famous distinction between Atlanticism and Eurasianism, Thalassocracy and Teleurocracy, the multiple and the one, etc. Yet these pairings remain entrenched within the vernacular of a dark subterranean insight into the true essence of material being below the watchful eye of the high-minded liberal rationalistic modernity. Quote, We must not go down the path of Icarus, we must return to the lowlands along the path of Orpheus. It is possible that we must turn and look at what they did with uh, Eurydice. Return, but illuminated by light, pierced by fire, consumed by lightning. Only then will we be able to understand the secret dimension of Heraclitus, the dark. All is one. Logos is chaos. Darkness is light. There is here. Hello to everybody watching. Pseudo-Marxist dimwits like Taran, the author continues, for whom Marxism is nothing more than an encyclopedia of virtue signaling and career climbing, interpret all language that falls outside the rigidity of Anglo-Saxon science as idealist. But for someone minimally educated in the history of idealism and materialism, it is not idealism, but a one-sided materialism that Dugan is guilty of. As already pointed out by thinkers like Bataille and their predecessors Nietzsche, etc., it takes no great effort to recognize that modernistic materialism is actually idealist. Modern English empiricism and French substantialism materialism attempts to straitjacket material reality to definite ideal forms, effectively attempting to condition any relation to the material world according to a rigid ideal, that of the form of measurement or predefined notion of materiality substance. Although this relation has produced results, it does not afford real precedence to material content over form. Here lies the key to the entire crisis of modern science, specifically in the realms of physics and biology. A Philistine could not possibly be a materialist. It is only through acculturation, through absorbing the treasures of mankind and possessing well-rounded literary sense, that one can give true expression to material being, which does not conform to the narrow parameters set by modern science and logic. Dugan's shortcomings, the author of this show, infrared.substack.com, article continues. 
parallel the shortcomings of late Soviet Marxism, Leninism itself. Only it is but its scandalous and occult obverse. Soviet Marxism, Leninism confined itself to an official ideology. Dugin's writings confined themselves to their real material premises, i.e. in the form of geopolitics, the unconscious realities of Russian civilization, etc. Dugin's principal scandal for Marxism, Leninism has only ever been an insistence on the precedence of a material reality not conditioned by a particular ideology. It is common to view Dugin's fourth political theory as a rebranding of the fascist third position, as to be expected from an ignoramus Philistine. Taran precisely attempts to draw this conclusion and fails pathetically. The author notes parenthetically, as you see. But the third position was not merely a rejection of capitalism and communism. The fourth political theory is not principally defined by merely rejecting the others, but by opening an inquiry into the real origins of 20th century politics itself, freed from the ideological prejudices inherent in them. The key lies not in the rejection, but the relativization of all three political theories, that there is a reality more fundamental than can be described within their terms. Thanks for joining in, everybody. A certain agnosticism is inherent in the fourth political theory. The author continues. All prior theories are definite, determinate, and particular. Liberalism, communism, and fascism. The name of the fourth remains ambiguous and left for further inquiry. The entire point is for there to be a fourth. Discovering its content is the entire purport of the project. However, boldly stated, what if this fourth political theory is none other than Marxism, Leninism itself? What if it is precisely and only Marxism, Leninism, and it's specifically dialectic materialism, which enables the possibility for reconciling its own ideology with its real material premises? Dugan was only ever exclusively familiar with Marxism, Leninism in its officiated, stagnant late Soviet form. But never did he and other Russian thinkers of the late Soviet period absorb the brilliance of Mao Zedong's thoughts, Mao Zedong thoughts contribution to Marxism Leninism. The same brilliance to which Chinese communism's vitality and success owes itself to. Let me just pause for a second. People mentioning has in the chat. Is that who this is? Show infrared.substack.com is has the other name, let's say, or the like the person who runs this um substack. So I see in the chat, yes, and he's adopted some of Dugan's ideas. Okay, good to know. I'm quite enjoying this, I gotta say. Uh, let's go back. Where did I stop here? The overwhelming majority of Soviet thinkers ignored Mao's reinvigoration of Marxism, Leninism entirely, insisting that the choice was between only stagnant official Soviet Marxism, Leninism, or Western liberalism. Yet, the way in which China was able to avoid the fate of the Soviet Union, Mao Zedong thought is self evidently, at the very least, worthy of examination. To paraphrase Alain Badiou, Mao's principal contribution was the introduction of a notion of infinity to Marxism. Not only the adoption of a fourth, but a fifth, sixth, seventh, etc. political theory are already integral to the constantly self-revolutionizing, self-reforming, and self-restructuring nature of Chinese communism. The context that gave rise to Mao, who ranks among the greatest political leaders in the history of mankind, uh, lied not in the commitment to an ideology, but in the commitment to a people, culture, and civilization. The primary material context that defined Mao's political life was never premised by ideology, but by the aspirations of the Chinese people and the rejuvenation of their 5,000 year civilization. In a sense, Mao was a Duganist before Dugan was ever born. Mao was already well acquainted and deeply immersed in the geopolitical, literary, civilizational, traditional, unconscious, demotic, national, even mystical, etc. realities that had to be scandalously exhumed by Dugan. The overwhelming majority of Mao's literary education, for example, came not from the modern West, but from the classics of Chinese literature. Uh, thanks to everybody in the comments who answered. Not somebody I was familiar with before and not an outlet I was familiar with before. Someone sent it to me, thought I might enjoy it, and uh, that's why we're looking it over together. Forcing the ideology of Marxism, Leninism to confront, survive, and readapt to its real material premises in the Chinese people defined the entirety of Mao's political life and the life of the communist 
party of China to this day. Mao's on contradiction already evinces a materialist view on the contingency of ideology and politics in the face of material reality. This is clear in the distinction between primary and secondary contradictions. For Mao, in the midst of the Japanese invasion of China, ideological and even internally political differences are relegated to secondary significance, much in the same way that they were in the aftermath of the Soviet collapse and in the so-called Red-Brown Alliance. The unity of the country against Japanese aggression becoming the primary contradiction. This is not the unity of shared ideas or ideals, but a unity based on the material and geopolitical conflict between the Chinese nation and Japan. For Mao, this conflict is objective, whereas the differing political ideologies are subjective articulations of this objective conflict. It was Mao's view that Marxism-Leninism would prove the best equipped interface with the objective conditions, but that had to be proven in the wilderness of material reality, war, not presumed. Dugan's error, the author continues, lies in his rejection that the contradiction between official ideals and the deeper, darker, esoteric truths of reality itself takes determinate form and reproduces itself across the whole fabric of being. Yes, Marxist-Leninist ideology cannot condition its real premises, but neither can one go about giving expression to these premises without acknowledging what it is they premise. Dugan remains agnostic about this, which is why his thinking, despite its brilliance, creativity, and insight, never transitions into a science that is a form of thinking that produces real knowledge, as opposed to ambiguous sense, and practical insights. For Mao, that Marxism-Leninism cannot condition its own premises is already a superfluous insight, an insight that is already contained within the essence of Marxism-Leninism itself. Materialist dialectics are precisely about reconciling the contradiction between content and form, the content being nothing more than the very essence of the contradiction itself. The entire body of knowledge and insight proper to Marxism-Leninism consists not in its officiated dogmas, but a repository of accumulated wisdom in the face of these precise contradictions. Again, just for the benefit of anybody showing up here 40 minutes into the live stream, I am reading showinfrared.substack.com, The Brahmins of Democracy, because it has something to do with Dugan and with a response to the Communist Party USA article that criticized anybody on the left who's attracted by Dugan. And I guess for those of you like me who are new to Infrared, the guy who wrote this is Has, and Infrared, as Mango writes in the chat, is a media collective of like 10 or 12 people around the world. And here we are discussing Marxism-Leninism in the context of the response to this criticism of Dugan. Marxism-Leninism is not just an ideology. It's an index of definite, concrete, and historical experience. It is a repository of practical working insights that are pragmatic in nature and which do not necessarily lend themselves to a given ideological orientation. The insights of Marxist-Leninist science are pragmatic and objective. What one makes of them is the province of a competing multitude of ideological orientations. Hence, at any given stage in the history of the Communist Party of China, there remain right, left, and center orientations, with the party's survival depending on the victory of the left orientation, not to be confused with the ultra-left. Xi, for example, has initiated uh, this ideological orientation in the form of a spiritual and moral revolution in culture, literature, arts, and media. What Dugan does not understand is that notwithstanding the multitude of political ideologies, that material reality gives rise to, ideology plays a part in affecting the determinate form of material being. This is proven by how, despite Marxism, Leninism being officially abandoned, Russia and other former Soviet states remain unconsciously affected by it from culture to intuitive ways of thinking. And just um, directing attention over to the chat, AB writes, this whole discourse started with backlash from the following tweet with detractors challenging the whole concept of patriotic socialism. Okay, so there's some backstory to this article and to the debate that it's taking part in. This does not mean that Marxism-Leninism can replace or condition geopolitical, civilizational, national, cultural, etc. realities. Only that communism led by Marxist-Leninist parties has irreversibly affected and become part of those geopolitical, civilizational, national, and cultural realities, even well after being abandoned ideologically. This is precisely what Dugan misses in his critique of modernity. 
Yes, modernity was the greatest apocalypse experienced by mankind, but the only path to the revival of the great Asiatic land empires lies not in rejecting or resisting it, but rendering it superfluous and merely a single chapter in a vastly older story, feats which the Soviet Union and China had actually accomplished. Dugan does not think beyond the threshold of apocalypse, and perhaps that is not necessarily a shortcoming. It is an inherent feature of Russian literature to remain permanently enamored by an apocalypse always on the horizon, forestalled only by the Katahan. Such a perspective has produced some of the most brilliant, beautiful, and insightful works in the history of mankind. However, so far as Marxism-Leninism is concerned, it could not confine itself to the narrow Soviet perspective, but this does not mean it has been outmoded. Marxism-Leninism has no meaning in the 21st century insofar as it has not integrated the contributions of Mao Zedong thought. And nowhere outside of China has any Marxist-Leninist party successfully integrated these contributions. Psychotic perversions of Mao's thinking, which can be found in Western Maoism, ignore the rich depth of the Chinese civilizational context that informed Mao's thought. As for the official communist parties that have survived, not once have they humbled themselves before the lesson of the Soviet Union's collapse. The Communist Party of the United States, which the Philistine Terran writes on behalf of, has yet to acknowledge the contributions of Mao and Zedong thought over 30 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In its arrogant inertia, it appears the Communist Party would rather dissolve than accept the challenge, sorry, excuse me, than accept the Chinese side having been vindicated after the Sino-Soviet split. It clings to a corrupted and liberalized form of Soviet Marxism-Leninism that has been entirely defanged of its occult cosmo-apocalyptic tendencies. The party is ruled by a pro-Gorbachev wing that clownishly pretends Gorbachev's treachery has not already been proven indisputably catastrophic. The same decadence, corruption, and inertia is also responsible for the Communist Party's erroneous conception of the Popular Front and anti-fascism, which underlies the entirety of Taran's rallying call to the mental pygmies, weaklings, and traitors of the party against the patriotic socialists, red-brown infiltrators, Duganists, and fascists. Okay, give me like 10 seconds here to have a rest and a drink of my coffee. Thanks everybody who's watching. Like, share, subscribe, whatever. We're reading showinfrared.substack.com, the Brahmins of democracy, to tell you what uh, it is that we've been focused on for the last... 45 minutes or so, and the link is in the chat. You can find it online. We're going to keep going through this whole thing. I'm really enjoying it. I just want to drink my coffee. Hang on a second. Those of you who are in on the debate that's taking place here, you can hash it out, as I say, in the chat, in the comments, if you'd like to say what you think about all of this, whose side you take and why, what arguments you find compelling and which you find weak or whatever the case is. The real origins of the popular front. Taran writes, quote, Dugan says that in the 21st century, there's no left and right, only those who oppose the status quo and those who support it. He clears out these historically rooted distinctions because his intention is to consume the left completely, to negate it. He wants to wear the skin of the Communist Party like the mystical huckster he is to summon his neo-fascist demons, unquote. Let us for a moment... Put aside the fact that Dugan has not once made pretense to wearing the skin of the Communist Party. Let us for a moment put aside the fact that here Karen, I mean Taran, evinces all the Anglo-American racism typical of the paranoid white supremacist whose eyes bulge with venomous hateful fear of the Asiatic Slavic Rasputin conjuring up his demons. This is typical American racism. When one does not understand the other, you simply accuse them of sorcery. This is precisely what we witnessed during the Russiagate scandal, where liberal white Karens like Rachel Maddow went on live television with a deranged, twisted look on their face and screamed about the Russian sorcery that stole the election from their idle, crooked Hillary. We can imagine that Taryn imagines a similar situation is imminent as regards to the very powerful position she acquired within the Communist Party, where Sputin-like sorcerers are going to conjure demons and remove her from her position just as they stole the power from Hillary. Dugan has no intentions with the Communist Party of the United States. Taryn, I can assure you of that, writes, has. The person you're looking for is actually me. 
It is I, alongside the rest of the infrared collective, who have the fullest intention to restructure the Communist Party. We've made no secret of this, nor the methods within our employment, so there's absolutely no need to talk about our conjuring demons and mystical sorcery. And the reason I have revealed our plans so openly is because we already made sure of the fact that there's nothing, and I mean nothing, you can do to stop us. Shots fired, I guess. You guys probably know better than I do the ins and outs of that. However, Taryn's broader point speaks to a very clear liberal pathology in regards to fascism, namely an association of fascism with ideological ambiguity. The famously obese YouTube streamer called Vosh, who, uh, Vosh, who amasses an audience of around 5,000 concurrent viewers, when pressed with the question of how to define fascism, will often say that fascism is intentionally undefinable, but an affect of ideological chaos. Liberals believe that political phenomena is ultimately premised by ideals, principles, axioms, concepts, rational precepts, etc. This rigidity of the object, which I have before termed as the Anglo box, is further practiced in reality within institutions and establishments. Institutions and establishments are not actually real societies, but parodies of the real society. Social engineering is very easy within the confines of institutions. It's much easier to change culture in academia than on the street because there people's behavior is conditioned by consciously legislated rules. By contrast, on the street, people's behavior is determined by factors which cannot be premised by ideals. This is why the label of fascism is much broader in scope than uh, mere political phenomena for liberals. Every expression of human spontaneity, every manifestation of the unconscious, every instance of chaos is crucified as fascist. For some, even eating meat is fascist. After all, from the perspective of idealist ethics, the way we consume food is quite scandalous. We kill animals for food and only later make up rational justifications for why. The truth, however, is that why we do it isn't premised by ideals in the first place. Fascism, one is told, is ideologically undefinable, inherently vague and ambiguous, since it is not consistent with any precepts. One thus must take refuge not only in the liberal institutions, which are at the very least definable and consistent, one must pass beyond the threshold of cuckoldry and excuse the transgressions of these liberal institutions and the way in which they themselves violate their own principles in the name of protecting democracy from fascism. One must rally behind an unelectable establishment which has no sanction, whoops, even by the liberal institutions themselves, but is a dirty secret everyone is supposed to look the other way in the midst of. All this to defend us from quote-unquote fascism. Labeling political opponents as domestic terrorists, COVID authoritarianism, violations of the right to political expression by big tech platforms accountable to no one, all to defend us from fascism, fueling the drums of war against other countries, turning a blind eye. It's all to protect us from fascism. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the lesson the traitors, again, just readings, reading show infrared.substack.com's article, Brahmins of Democracy, and you see the idea here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the lesson the traitors running the Communist Party have drawn from the popular front, enabling the transition from liberalism to something actually comparable to the conditions out of which arose fascism, all in the name of anti-fascism. Witness the paranoid mind of Taran Vosh, Vosh, how do you say that name, who label all instances of vague, intuitive, spontaneous, anti-establishment and populist sentiment as fascist. They take the very fact of its ideological vagueness, not as a deficiency of their description, but on the contrary, as proving it. For them, vagueness is not an indication of a definite material contradiction that takes precedence over ideological narratives, but the indication of a secret super ideology that is so powerful it manages to avoid disclosing its existence in any discreet way. If the irony is not dawning upon readers that the Communist Party has premised its paranoid anti-fascism on the basis of the history of the Popular Front, allow me to spell it out clearly. The Popular Front was precisely an acknowledgement, which was principally necessary among Western Communist parties, of materially political contradictions that take precedence over ideology. No ideals, principles, precepts, concepts, or even ideological common ground united the forces of the popular front, nor could they. What rather united them was a common structural positioning and a contradiction between a rotting establishment teetering on the brink of open dictatorship and authentically and genuinely popular forces. 
The popular front was genuinely supposed to be popular. That is representing the material will of the people at the expense of ideological purity. If there's any ideological vagueness to be found, the history of the popular front is the greatest example of it. Populism was an integral notion to its original conception and most of its execution. Today, most people interpret the popular front as an attempt to rally behind a liberal establishment and defend it against the threat of fascism, yet there's nothing that is nothing more than a falsification of history. All right, I hope you're enjoying this. We're almost an hour in. I'm going to keep going. It's a long article and we should just get through it. It's, uh, there's a lot here to think about. Within the American context, the New Deal coalition had fresh, freshly risen to power as the literal successor of the People's Party, the epitome of American populism, in the early 1900s. By the way, I hope the author wouldn't mind me going over this in this way. I guess you have a bigger audience in any case. Uh, some people who might not have seen it otherwise. Within the American context, the New Deal coalition had freshly risen to power as the literal successor of the People's Party, the epitome of American populism, in the early 1900s. It shook up the then existing form of the American establishment by representing a broader strata of the population than had ever been given representation in government. The Anglophile ruling class found itself being ruled by cabinet members hailing from families and backgrounds of small farmers from the very heartland of the country. Uh, Roosevelt's contrast to the Democrats of today was an authentically popular president who shook up rather than represented the then status quo. The predecessors of the deep state and the dynastic families of the current American establishment opposed him bitterly. In 1933, military officer Smedley Butler uncovered a plot by this same establishment, including none other than Prescott Bush, grandfather of neoconservative George W. Bush, an anti-fascist hero who bravely stood up to Trump to defend our democracy, to execute a coup against Roosevelt and establish a fascist dictatorship directly answerable to Wall Street. Notwithstanding the various contradictions faced by the Roosevelt's government, including the political emergence of the professional managerial, later conflicts with, later conflicts with populists like Huey Long, etc., it's necessary to establish this context so as to point out that the anti-fascism of the 1930s has nothing to do with today's Antifa. The fascist threat was not coming from populist forces challenging the establishment, but from the very rotten core of the establishment itself. The Popular Front was not a concession to the status quo, it was a concession to national populism. That there was a material contradiction at hand that could not be premised by the terms of ideology and that the goal of communists was to seek to lead by example as the most effective representatives of the popular forces rather than establish the terms of struggle on ideological terms. This was all superfluous for the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union who had already risen to power on the basis of taking this for granted, but it was a genuine breakthrough against the dogmatic ultra-left infantilism and sectarian factionalism that had plagued Western communists since the demise of the Second International. And just over to the chat, I'm glad to hear the author will love it. It's a well-written, thorough piece and I hope everybody's enjoying it like I am. The ideological vagueness associated with fascism consists in nothing more than the self-destruction of the classical liberal order in the aftermath of 1929, which gave rise to a general atmosphere of meta-politics. All political factions became relativized in the midst of this historical change, hence fascism's appearance of novelty. But fascism was not some mystical, atavistic resurrection of the wealth of substantive realities, long kept at bay by the cold abstractionism of liberal modernity, but the final conclusion of the latter, an abstract negation for itself. Far from representing the chaos of occult or demonic forces, fascism was nothing more than liberalism plus emergency powers. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Powers that completely transgressed the foundations of 19th century classical liberalism, while at the same time safeguarding them from the chaos of Asiatic Jewish Bolshevism. In actual fact, Terran's anti-fascist pretenses bear more in common with the pathology of anti-Semitism, which recoils at the liquefying chaos by imposing a false sense of order, that is a Jewish conspiracy, than with the anti-fascist popular front of the 1930s. Despite being objectively outmoded by the winds of history, fascism was the attempt by the Anglo-liberal order of the 19th century to secure its foundations absolutely against 
the chaos of material change. Fascism aspired to resolve the entire scandal of modernity, that is the inability for the Cartesian cogito or modern rationality to ground its own premises. Antisemitism, as well as European colonialist racism, depicted non-Europeans as subhumans who contaminated the purity of abstract liberal modernity, who represented the chaos of material antecedents which obstructed the ability for modern forms to ground their own premises and establish its own history. Civilization for fascists was synonymous. Sorry, hold on. Yes, Leo, I'm still doing this. It's a long article. It'll be a while. Civilization for fascists was synonymous with totalizing subordination to the abstractly contrived precepts of modernity. The ultimate safe space for what was the equivalent of today's social justice warriors, white liberal Karens, and institutionalized social engineers. This is why, for all its aesthetic pretenses, fascism was never able to establish itself as a popular rural movement. Its only rural basis lied in monopoly landowners. Beyond this, its rank and file were urbanized to the core. I'm just going to pause for one second. Those of you who are here, again, those of you who are skipping forward and around in the video on a replay later, we're going over showinfrared.substack.com article, The Brahmins of Democracy, uh, responding to the Communist Party of USA's article on Dugan. I'm enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it. Authors has. Let's go on. By contrast, the popular front was in tandem with Stalin's resurrection of Russian civilization and elevation of the Russian peasant as the primary subject of Soviet politics and culture. And it is this which is meant by democratic, not conformity to liberal institutions. Uh, the popular front was authentically national, the author writes. The triumph of Stalin and the complete repudiation of Trotsky took the principal form of the way in which communist parties the world over, and especially in the post-war period, began to embrace the national culture, tradition, and history of their respective countries. It is with the popular front that communism for the first time became deeply national in the cultural and demotic sense. This veneration of national culture did not simply extend to perceived modern aspects. Figures like Ivan the Terrible, Alexander Nevsky, Martin Luther, Vlad Tepes became celebrated as national heroes by ruling communist parties. And nowhere did the popular front gain as much sweeping significance as in China, forming the definite context out of which arose Mao Zedong thought in the first place. The idealist confusion of the present Communist Party strictly arises from the erroneous view that the Popular Front was united by an opposition to an ideology rather than a definite political phenomena. It's not the ideological details of fascism that were of any significance to the communist theorists of the Popular Front, it was a new political stage the established liberal order was entering into that discarded the most minimally democratic liberties outright and shamelessly. The bourgeoisie as a class ceased to possess any material incentive to defend or uphold any semblance of democratic order. The task fell upon popular forces to do so instead. But this democratic order was not the idea of democracy, political correctness, or the veneer of democracy but the formally plain rights guaranteed to the people by the state. Basic liberties like free expression, political association, and due process. Yet, these are rights that are being curtailed today, not by fascist populists, but by the liberal status quo itself. And again, the most passionate defenders of these plain formal rights are precisely those condemned as red-brown infiltrators by the likes of Terran. The anti-fascist pathology of today's liberals has permanently sealed off the foundational critiques of modern liberal capitalism that Marxism itself arose out of. Instead of viewing ambiguous thinkers like Dugan, etc. as fascists, why not recognize them for what they are? belonging to the very broad canon of spontaneous non-Marxist socialists and communists. The Communist Manifesto describes nearly half a dozen different socialist tendencies in its time, the most prevalent of which being reactionary, feudal, and petty bourgeois tendencies. Communism or socialism in its spontaneous, unelaborated, and unscientific manifestations represent vague, inconsistent, dissipated, and even obscurantist rejections of the prevailing order and establishment, this does not mean they can be dismissed as fascist. 
because fascism was the tool of, his, of an entrenched industrial, imperialist, and international financial bourgeoisie. It was not an authentically spontaneous or popular phenomenon. The Popular Front was precisely an acknowledgement by Western communists of the need to recognize the meta-political realities ushered in in the aftermath of 1929. A reality more fundamental than premised by specific political ideologies became clear, namely the minimum of formal democratic rights. But as to their actual content, they are profusely national in character, democracy referring not to some abstract or ideal people, but the people as they really and actually existed, inclusive of all their historical traditions and national character. The defense of these rights against fascism was not in the name of defending the ideology of liberalism, but defending the rights of the people. This is why it was called the Popular Front and not something like the Liberty Front. How does today's Communist Party, by contrast, interpret the significance of the Popular Front? In purely ideological terms, as a need to rally behind the Democrats against the threat coming from the quote-unquote right or the Republican Party. There was far more merit to this argument during the Bush era of the United States, when the Republican Party was led by neoconservatives, who did indeed threaten the democratic rights of the people through the Patriot Act, increased surveillance, etc. Yet even this would still have been a completely erroneous conception. After all, the Clinton and Obama administrations arguably did more to make inroads in encroaching upon the constitutional rights of the American people than Bush did. Indeed, not any principled political theoretical error, but purely ideological pathology can be blamed for the Communist Party's revisionist veneer of maintaining continuity with the Popular Front, a pathology related to the emergence of mass media in general. As pointed out by theorists like Baudrillard, the era of mass media has imposed a new relationship between individuals and reality, including the reality of politics. Politics is indistinguishable from the appearance of politics, democracy from the appearance of democracy, etc. And with the rise of mass media, there has emerged an ideological block instantiated in what is today known as the establishment. The intuitive clarity of concepts like the professional managerial class stem not so much from the technical functions carried out by the member of this class, as much as by the work they do to enforce ideological cohesion and consistency. They are the Brahmins of democracy, who assume the enlightened role of projecting a veneer of democracy and knowing when to look the other way in the midst of its contradictions. They uphold a discourse of collective lies, political correctness, wokeness, etc., in the name of defending democracy against disorder, chaos, instability, and fascism. Taran wants us to believe that corporate America has merely hijacked authentic democratic struggles and pushes its whitewashed progressive agenda due to popular pressures coming from below. Should we hold our laughter? What popular pressure? Yeah, it's a long article, I know, but we're going to go through it anyway. There's nothing more outrageous, unpopular, and scandalous to the American public than the so-called progressive agenda being pushed by, the corporate, uh, by corporate America and the media. Big tech platforms have to resort to forms of mass censorship in order to repress authentic popular expressions in regard to them. YouTube even had to hilariously remove the dislike counter because of how popular the woke, I mean, democratic agenda is among the American people. Leftists nervously respond to this with anxiety about how popular fascism truly is, fueling their anti-popular Menshevik sentiments. But the truth is, these are the sincere and authentic democratic sentiments of the people. And any honest person electing to interpret them can see that imposing upon these sentiments the conclusion of fascism is an act of grotesque bad faith. Indeed, the popular pressure Taryn is referring to in that CommunistPartyUSA.org article about Dugan, uh, and maybe elsewhere as well, has always been imposed from above. If corporate America's progressive agenda came from below, why do you not find enthusiastic supporters of this agenda among the lowest quote unquote segments of the people in the chain of corporate America's information institution complex? The more rural people are, the more they possess reservations, skepticism, and outright hostility to all manifestations of the so-called progressive agenda. The more educated, urbanized, and institutionalized they are, the more they're on board with it. And why? Because the latter are the prostitutes of corporate America 
while the former more or less don't have to make a living through demonstrations of ideological conformity or loyalty to it. A rural American can say, kiss my ass to the progressive agenda and still feed their family. Yet if one of these purple haired urban kulaks so much as questions the so-called co-opted progressive agenda, they will have no way of funding their expensive vegan diet or monthly subscription to Chapo House. Does that sound like democratic pressure from below to you? She, alongside the leadership of the Communist Party, interpret democratic struggle as the uninterrupted continuity of time under the reign of the establishment. Progress simply means the latest fad. Reactions and means attempting to interrupt the continuity of the ever-evolving corporate agenda disseminated by mass media. Such is the cuckolded, shameful, and cowardly line the Communist Party is attempting to enforce on bond of expulsion. And yet, there exists real precedent for this erroneous conception of progress and democracy. It is none other than the essential split and distinction between the Bolshevik and Menshevik factions of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. The majoritarian Bolsheviks, who wagered their faith in the backward Russian masses, and the minoritarian Mensheviks, who believed that the duty of communists uh, lied in tailing the urban bourgeoisie so as to protect the progressive and democratic movement from the reactionaries. The Communist Party repudiates the very same Bolshevik line that gave rise to the existence of the party in the first place. Those of you who are here, who are just joining, who have been here for a long time, we're reading Has show infrared.substack.com the brahmins of democracy i'm seeing it for the first time some of you may be well familiar with these debates on the left and some of you may be learning about them for the first time democracy bolshevism versus menshevism the communist party has made a habit of excusing its treachery its prostitution to the democrats and its tailing behind the agenda of corporate america in the name of defending small d democratic struggles taren writes quote some even see the January 6th fascist riots at the Capitol as an effort to overturn the bourgeois democratic process, and they become excited. They see history in motion and think it's good news. They say that the worker is fed up with bourgeois democracy. What they want to put in its place is not perfect, but they imagine it could be negotiated on. Whatever this new system is, it must be better than liberalism, whatever that means to those who say it. Unquote. Absolutely nobody who has expressed sympathy to the events of January 6th has framed this sympathy in terms of opposing bourgeois democracy. I challenge Taryn to produce a simple, single example of a person of any significance on the left doing this, just one. You will find that she can't because she's making this up to set up the context for her argument. We need to be pearl-clutching liberal Karens because January 6th was an assault on bourgeois democracy. And while bourgeois democracy is bad, it's better than fascism. Instead of just saying this nonsense, she has to set up a complete straw man of leftists celebrating the destruction of democracy. The only people who are, to the laughter of the American public, framing January 6th in terms of democracy are the Democratic Party and their lick spittles, including the leadership of the Communist Party. There's probably not a single person who attended the January 6th protest who believed that they were undermining democracy. There's not a single person who expresses the minimum of sympathy or outreach to the protesters there who does this on the basis of thinking that democracy was going to be overthrown. So heaped up in the ideological narratives of the Democrats that Taryn has not even bothered to pay attention to the rhetoric of the other side. January 6th didn't happen because Trump's movement believed it was time to overthrow democracy, but because they sincerely and genuinely believed it was the Democrats who had undermined democracy by rigging the election in favor of Biden. Now, regardless of what you think as to the factual merit of this allegation, the fact stands that in contrast to actual fascist movements, the protesters at January 6th genuinely did believe they were protecting the Constitution and the democratic will of the people. Is this simply because they whimsically decided to reject the results of an election? Or perhaps the sentiment, even if mistaken, can actually be forgiven. What reason did Trump supporters have to trust the media and trust the process being carried out under their auspices? WikiLeaks, a great fascist menace to democracy, revealed the way in which the Democrats rigged the primaries in favor of Hillary. The credibility of the established process was already destroyed by the way in which the media, the institutions, and the Democrats unfairly targeted and lied through their teeth about Trump for the entire duration of his four-year term. This led to a process of all trust being broken with the establishment, and rightfully so. The American establishment has repeatedly transgressed American democracy, the constitutional rights of the people, etc., and rules at its expense. 
It doesn't take a genius to recognize that the status quo has no basis in any democratic legitimation. The Democrats claim that January 6th was an assault on democracy. In reality, it was an assault on a symbol of so-called American democracy, the Capitol. In no substantive or materially political sense, the author writes, was democracy at any point ever imperiled. A mob of protesters threw a party in the Capitol building, boo-hoo. The veneer and prestige of sacred democracy was challenged, challenged. Never mind the actual reality of democracy having already been trampled upon by the successive Clinton, Bush, Obama, etc. administrations. Never mind the reality of democracy being dissolved by the emergence of a corrupt establishment which rules on the basis of open corruption. The real problem, the so-called leaders of the Communist Party want us to believe, is that images of protesters running around in the Capitol hurts their uh, feelings. And this is the sweeping materialism of Taran and other leaders of the party who replace sober materialist analysis with wishy-washy, ideologically liberal sentimentality. However, the ways in which Taran and the Communist Party use the word democracy does appear very curious. Taran appears to equate democracy with liberalism and moreover democracy and liberalism with the corporate media academic democratic party complex. Both of these equivocations reflect her embarrassingly, I'll say her embarrassing ignorance of the meaning of these words historically and specifically by communists. Okay, embarrassingly airheaded ignorance of the meaning of these words historically and specifically by communists. Lenin, for example, in no way equates democracy with liberalism. In his analysis of the Black Hundreds, Lenin identified a certain democratic current. Did he mean a liberal current? Did he mean a forward-thinking or culturally progressive by corporate America's standard or otherwise current? Let us see, quote, Bishop Nikon, quoting a letter from a peasant, does right. The land, bread, and other important questions of our Russian life and of the region do not appear to reach either the hands or the hearts of the authorities or the Duma. These questions and such a solution of them as is possible are regarded as utopian, hazardous, untimely. Why do you keep silent? What are you waiting for? For moods and revolts for which those same undernourished, hungry, unfortunate peasants will be shot down? We're afraid of big issues and reforms. We limit ourselves to trivialities and trifles, good though they may be. That is what Bishop Nikon writes, and that is why, that is what very many black hundred peasants think. It is quite understandable why Bishop Nikon had to be removed from the affairs and Duma speeches for such statements. A bishop expresses his black hundred democracy and arguments that are in essence very far from correct. The land, bread, and all other important questions do reach the hands and hearts and pockets of the authorities in the Duma, unquote. As you can see, Lenin does not identify democracy with any of the qualities presumed by Taran in her article. Lenin identifies democracy with the way in which Bishop Nikon attempts to give expression to the authentic aspirations of the demos or the Russian peasants, namely in the form of the question of land reform. The entire essence of the Bolshevik-Menshevik split lies in Lenin's unique view of democracy. The Mensheviks identified democracy with the continuity of historical progress that began in Western Europe and saw the urban reformers of the cadet party, as well as the urban petite bourgeoisie and big bourgeoisie as the basis of the democratic movement within Russia. In other words, just like Taran, the Mensheviks viewed any challenge to this movement to be reactionary since time flows only in one direction, the direction of progress. Lenin had a different dialectical view of historical time. In his 19, excuse me, 1899 work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia, Lenin viewed the democratic veneer of the urban bourgeoisie as just that, a veneer which disguised the impotence of their class in the face of Tsarism. To exhume the future, Lenin did something that's awfully reactionary by today's Communist Party standards. He looked to the most backward and underdeveloped segment of the Russian Empire, the peasantry, in order to predict how capitalism would come to develop. In other words, he more or less completely ignored the urban bourgeoisie and urban petite bourgeoisie as worthless parasites with absolutely no historical future and immediately decided to go down to the countryside influenced by Herzen and the uh, Narodniks to derive the long-term political strategy of the Russian Social Democratic Party in relation to the overthrow of Tsarism. Stagists believed that Russia first needed a bourgeois democratic revolution before socialists could rise to the task of their true historical mission. Lenin and his genius rightfully castigated this as an undialectical view of historical time. Progress is not led by the most advanced sections of society, but arises from within the most backward, since the most backward are not yet consolidated or established, but dwell in circumstances of oscillating historical chaos. The class antagonism was not strictly to be found in the already established differentiations 
that were to be found in the cities, but within the interstices of the peasants in the countryside. Lenin, in other words, made a wager upon chaos, while the Mensheviks played it safe, tailing behind the already established urban liberal bourgeoisie. He would have been castigated as a fascist by the likes of today's Communist Party, if only for the reason that he assumed the ultimate populist anti-establishment position without regard for being consistent with any dogmatic ideological precepts. This just reminds me of the Bannon calling himself a Leninist and obviously some communists considering Bannon a fascist. For Lenin, the essence of the democratic revolution uh, lied not in the enlightened, educated urban bourgeoisie toppling the Tsar, a laughably unlikely scenario, but in the peasants striving for land reform. Democratic revolutions not only establish all citizens as equal before the law, they imbue the state with the character of the people and set each individual on a new basis, the basis out of which capitalist class distinctions arise. Some sell commodities, others sell their labor, the very source of commodities. However, given the power of the Russian landed nobility, land reform was the only path to this democratic equalization, which paradoxically was not even possible on capitalist terms. Lenin rightfully recognized that the democratic revolution was not to be a stage that would precede the socialist one, but one that would occur simultaneously with it in an alliance of the proletariat and middle peasantry. An alliance with the urban bourgeoisie was opposed not in the name of ideological purity, but because they were in fact a reactionary class who gained all their wealth under the rule of Tsarism. The aspiring small bourgeoisie in the countryside, meanwhile, had everything to gain by a democratic revolution. Let me just stop for a second again. We're almost an hour and a half in. Thank you to those of you who are here. We are reading showinfrared.substack.com, the Brahmins of democracy. Probably getting uh, close to the end. The Communist Party precisely repeats the error of Mensheviks by identifying the democratic struggle with the already established avenues, institutions, and outlets of liberal democracy, leading to the utterly stupid conclusion that the woke cultural agenda is today's equivalent of democratic struggle. They do not elect to go down and seek the material essence and origins of things, but teeter-totter at the level of the most superficial appearance. They have not even so much as interrogated the question of, is there an equivalent within the United States of a land-owning monopolist class that obstructs democracy? Of course there is. Lenin identified it in his work Imperialism, the Highest Stage, proving that bourgeois democracy never actually overcame feudalism, and that aspects thought to be unique to the latter merely reemerged in new ways. Lenin recognized that imperialism had already destroyed the basis of bourgeois democracy among the bourgeoisie. What is the basis of the bourgeois democracy? Taryn seeks to defend against fascism and against fascism's fascists like Dugan, as she sees it. And why are her sentiments echoed by the deep state, the mainstream media, corporate America, and the most rotten sections of the imperialist bourgeoisie? They frame all struggle between the reactionary rednecks of Trump's movement and the enlightened urbanites of bourgeois democracy. They completely ignore, cast off, and are blind to the more ambiguous developments in rural America, shown in the article below. We're not going to click through to the article and read it, but you see it there. Or the disconnect and break Trump's movement now has with Trump himself over vaccines, a contradiction not dissimilar to the one Lenin identified among the Black Hundreds. If Trump's movement is today the equivalent of the Black Hundreds of the past, which is already a stretch, then to repeat Lenin's stance would not be to fearmonger over them as the foremost threat to the party, the movement, and the people, but to scoff at them as vain, misguided romantics condemned to failure, which is precisely what Lenin did. In writing about the treacherous alliance between the Mensheviks and the urban liberal cadet party, Lenin says, quote, Under such circumstances, the cries about the Black Hundred danger are the result either of absolute ignorance or of hypocrisy. And it is those who conceal their real aims and acts behind the scenes that must play the hypocrite. The Mensheviks are raising an outcry about the Black Hundred danger in order to divert the workers' attention from the game they, the Mensheviks, are playing or did play recently by joining the petty bourgeois bloc and bargaining with the cadets." Unquote. Are cries about the Black Hundred danger not eerily reminiscent of cries of the fascist danger of Trump? The difference lies only in the fact that while the Black Hundreds were a tool to prop up the Tsarist establishment, MAGA genuinely was a populist challenge, however misguided and inconsistent to the status quo. And even then, Lenin was still able to not place the danger of the Black Hundreds as the principal or primary contradiction facing the socialist movement. He even recognized ambiguously democratic currents within the Black Hundreds 
a socialist doing this for the Trump movement would risk immediately getting labeled as a red, brown or fascist. And probably Glenn Greenwald is one of the most prominent to come to mind in that connection. Moreover, to say that the Communist Party has joined with the Democrats is already too generous when the Communist Party has made itself even less than a prostitute of the Democrats. A prostitute is at least paid for services rendered, but an outright unwanted lickspittle, which the Democrats themselves consider an embarrassment. Continuing, it's clear what the democratic struggle amounts to in the present American context, drawing from the lessons of Lenin, going down to the country and establishing a broad coalition of popular forces, united by their opposition to the increasingly undemocratic and extra-constitutional establishment. The two-party duopoly is in no way an immortal or invincible feature of American democracy, and its foundations have already been entirely shaken by Trump. The time for an authentic third party of the people, which any competent communist party would preponderate hegemony over due to the uniquely correct insights derived from the science of Marxism-Leninism, has now come. The rise of Silicon Valley and the so-called big tech monopolies pose the greatest danger to any semblance to the foundations of the republic and any semblance of democracy, that is the formal rights and liberties of the people, since fascism swept Europe in the 1930s. The struggle to restore the democratic republic and defense of the liberties of the people from the deep state establishment is the principal task of communists within America, writes, has. Show infrared.substack.com. The democratic establishment has already allied itself with the Ukrainian junta propped up by the fascist thugs of the Maidan, aggressively positioning itself alongside NATO against Russia to complete Hitler's genocidal vision of enslaving, exterminating, and subjugating the Asiatic Slavs and now seeks to whip the American public into a frenzy for war against China over the Taiwan province. The sweeping and long-term ambitions of the world's elite were made clear in Davos, as we already witnessed them make pre preparations for their great reset. The forces of production have already transformed is the superstructure of bourgeois democracy, and not in Terran's sense, but in the real sense, going to survive it. Have the prerequisites not already been made for the open dictatorship of the tech elites and totalizing repression of the people? All of this happens, the author continues, while the Communist Party elevates the squabble over toilets and abortions as the epitome of democratic struggle, while denouncing any trace of populist sentiment as fascist and reactionary. But beware, the bogeyman of Dugan, Red Brown's fascists. Yes, there's an epilogue, we're going to read it and wrap this up. Liberalism self-destruction. A degree of confusion may arise as to the significance of liberalism in the corresponding communist stance. Karl Kotsky famously remarked, and I'm paraphrasing, that communists suppose liberalism from the perspective of presupposing its achievements, while reactionaries oppose liberalism from the past. This is more or less the sentiment shared by all Western communists, despite being entirely undialectical and untrue. As Domenico Losordo pointed out, the question of liberalism is not a question of any progress to be situated within a vector of historical time. Liberalism itself is inherently contradictory and comes with a double-edged sword. Oftentimes, forms of resistance against liberalism were forms of resistance against liberalism in its most anti-human, genocidal, and bloodthirsty of manifestations. Phenomena like modern slavery sanctioned by liberalism, as Lacerdo points out, were the most barbarous, savage, and inhuman in the history of mankind. The notion that liberalism represents progress in the history of humanity does not belong to Marxism, but to the Whig conception of a linear progressive history. In reality, liberalism does not so much represent progress as it does a certain inevitability, that inevitability being the abstract negation corresponding to the rise of bourgeois subjectivity, which humanity experienced as a complete apocalypse from the land enclosures of England to the barbaric genocides of colonialism. The way in which communism sublates liberalism does not lie in supporting liberals or in accepting manifestations of, lib of liberalism, but by sublating the essence of what makes liberalism inevitable, namely the development of the forces of production. By mastering the science of the forces of production, the anti-human catastrophe, which is historical liberalism, can be avoided entirely, which it has in countries like China, Russia, for its part is still suffering from progressive liberalism that nearly destroyed the country entirely in the 1990s. Whew. We're an hour and a half in. We're going to do this, though. The author put in the work and we're going to put in the work. However, it's also mistaken to confuse liberalism in its broader historical sense with the liberal globalism of the 21st century. 
Dugan's analysis here is quite insightful. Historically, liberalism opened avenues of freedom at the expense of repressive traditions, parochial cultures, archaic laws, antiquated morality, and pre-existing norms. By the time of the counterculture, when more or less everything is on the table and the people of the West are free to do whatever they want, liberalism entered a new stage of its development, namely that of totalitarianism. That's what Dugan calls liberalism 2.0. Uh, or liberalism at the end of the ideological war of the 20th century. The very same freedom guaranteed by liberalism has turned against it. This freedom, for example, manifests in people's preferences for a more traditional lifestyle, religious expression, whoops, sorry about that, and ability to not have to be politically incorrect. In this new stage of liberal psychosis, which is surely laying the ground for a real fascism of the 21st century, liberalism is attempting to finally fully ground its premises by annihilating any trace of human substantive content. Even humanity in the literal sense is becoming challenged with the rise of transhumanistic ideals, which will surely remain only, only ideas, as scientific capabilities are extremely over-exaggerated. Unconscious norms and realities are now decried as manifestations of secret structures of patriarchy and white supremacy. Liberalism is no longer synonymous with freedom, but forced affirmation. Liberalism itself, after all, gave rise to this contradiction. Having exhausted its historical mission, the last obstacle to liberal freedom turned out to be liberalism itself. Yet, in contrast to Dugan's view, there's a way to preserve liberal freedom without entering into the 21st century genocidal liberalism of the modern West. That is precisely what states like Russia, China, and others have already done. I'm not sure that's in contrast to Dugan's view. Their illiberalism does not lie in the repudiation of 19th century liberalism, but its sublation into a higher form of statehood, a form of statehood that is the inheritance of 20th century communism. Okay, nice contrast there, Dugan. Finally, under this identity politics category, and everybody who's tuning in now or watching this later, show infrared.substack.com to give credit where it's due. Their article, The Brahmins of Democracy, written, I guess, by Haz, about some infighting in the Communist Party, about the populist challenge represented by Dugan and others. This is the article we've been reading and going through We're now on this, I think, probably final section on identity politics. Finally, Taryn and the Communist Party make a point of privileging the question of Black Lives Matters as the principal political question and matters of race, the foremost integral components of the democratic struggle. This again stems from their sort of that racist patronizing view towards those groups within the United States that are not represented by the state. Stemming from a lack of materialist analysis, they do not place to the fore the land question, which is almost single-handedly responsible for the racial antagonism that has persisted within the United States up to the present day. Moreover, the hostility of the Communist Party toward authentically popular black nationalist leaders and organizations, while heaping praise upon the corporate and George Soros-sponsored Black Lives Matter, eliminates the whole of their credibility so far as questions of racial oppression are concerned. The Communist Party, the article continues, has nothing to do with America's black people, has no leadership over America's black people, and no popularity. Point blank and simple. As for the emphasis on the point of America's multiracial working class, what exactly is the point? Not even Trump's movement cares to depict itself as exclusively white, so where does this liberal idiocy come from? It comes straight from the paranoid fantasies of the identitarian liberals who in their obsession with race elect to chase ghosts where there are none. Certainly the media's overemphasis on Charlottesville, etc., has led to the view that Trump's movement is inevitably white supremacist. The truth is that Trump's movement is very racially ambiguous. It has led to an unprecedented degree of support for the Republican Party among the black population, and Latinos make up a very strong component of MAGA, even in countries close to the Mexican border, excuse me, counties close to the Mexican border in Texas. Needless to say, a deeper superior materialist analysis is necessary than the one copy and pasted straight from the mouths of the commentators of MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, and other academic Philistines and parasites. By no means does their assessment reflect the reality on the ground. A new beginning beyond the false polarization of the Democrats and Republicans and their respective discourses is necessary. Materialism, after all, begins with the sobriety of accepting the possibility that everything you already think about the world is 
wrong. Okay, infrared essays, Marxist Leninist analysis beyond the visible spectrum. I'll take you to the top of the article so you can see what it is that we've had the pleasure of reading together. The Brahmins of Democracy, Bolshevism versus Menshevism, infrared. I'll drop the link once more here in the chat for those of you who want to have a look. And that's pretty much it. I wanted to go over that with you. Thank you for your time and attention. You should comment on the article. If there's something that you'd like to contribute to the conversation that the author has begun. And I would appreciate it if you'd like and comment on the video, share, subscribe, uh, do whatever feels appropriate. Thanks so much for your time and attention, everybody. And thank you to Haz for the article and to the person who sent it to me. See you in the next video.